We're delighted to have Dr. Matthew Fry, who uh, is, as the slide shows, from uh, an organisation known as Turning Point, which is linked into uh, Eastern Health here. Ma Matthew also has uh, linkages with uh, Monash University and is past president of a chapter of addiction medicine and uh, has also published uh, and written more generally on uh, codeine dependence. So I think it's a good segue uh, from the earlier talk about approaches to deal with opioid uh, using patients to actually focusing more specifically on the issue of dependence. So thank you, Matthew. Thanks. Um, okay, and, and thanks for inviting me and uh, thanks for Penny and uh, Malcolm's presentation. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to... Um, I'm aware of time, so some of uh, what I talk about has been covered, which is gratifying that nothing I'm, that's on my slide is contradictory to what, what anyone else has said. But it, and it also means I can skip over and we can have a uh, move closer to a discussion, I guess. So I'm going to talk a bit about, I'm going to be nostalgic about codeine, um, uh, talk a bit about pharmaceutical opioids, but again, uh, I knew Malcolm would be here and covering most of that. Uh, talk a bit about over-the-counter drugs because it's a really interesting area. We've got a lot of pharmacists here as well. Um, and um, uh, talk about management of codeine dependence. So, look, I just wanted to reflect on... And when you were saying, John, before um, uh, of the media on codeine, I mean, codeine is like, you know, the, the issue that keeps on giving. I mean, I, um, you know, in my work... I'm, I'm, you know, moving on into towards retirement and, um, uh, you know, uh, looking at the stuff that I've done and and what's asked, what what gets asked about, and um, you know, I worked in doctors' health and uh, uh, you know, to work in methamphetamine and harm reduction. All anyone ever wants to talk about uh, whenever there's a media inquiry to Eastern Health, and we get a lot of media inquiries to turning point at Eastern Health, it's always about over-the-counter codeine. No, no, no one wants to talk about anything else in the media. I, I can't... I've done media training at Eastern Health just to cope with the codeine inquiries. I can't <laughs> think of anything that's more interesting to the general public than codeine, over-the-counter codeine. So it's going to be kind of sad when it, when it, when it goes, <laughs> I think. I won't have anything to do. Yeah, I'll go into withdrawal. Yeah, yeah. So it's still legal in the UK, or over the counter in the UK. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, I wanted to reflect, um, going back about a decade, and what what happened back uh, then was we were seeing people coming in. Those to the hospitals I worked at as an addiction specialist, and they're coming in with um, various gastroenterological conditions and and sometimes renal conditions. Uh, and they were, they were called, by, called by the gastroenterologist an NSAID toxicity related presentation uh, and there was a really characteristic uh, picture or fingerprint of, of how these people looked and um, uh, yeah, you know there was a few things and I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of the, the biochemistry that, that was pathognomic of, of these presentations and um, the other thing was they're always, they, they come in and they say, oh, this guy's taking 24 over the counter or 48, and this was back in 2007, and this was, of course, related to pack size at the time um, of, of the, the popular product on the market, a buprofen codeine product. And um, this was a typical presentation. So I'd be, you, often it was a woman, but it was a, a middle-aged person or someone in their 50s um, who came in, usually they were pretty grey and pallid and, and tired, and they were taking a lot of non-steroidals, as I mentioned, um, and uh, they'd usually um, started treatment of, uh, of a self-treatment of a chronic back condition or a headaches or something like that. Uh, and, and the gastros would say, it's this odd chap, and it, they would eventually get to drug and alcohol, but he's um, uh, got an NSAID-related corrosion and um, uh, 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 this funny um, picture of, of overuse of non and we don't know why he's taking so many non He's taking this product called Nurofen Plus. And this was the, the typical picture, and I'll point to the, the potassium level. So classic was like a low potassium, a blood loss anemia, and I'm taking 48 um, uh, over-the-counter painkillers a day. So uh, it got to the stage where I'd only have to see like the, the biochemistry and the, um, and the FBE result, and I'd know this was a, a it became like a parlor trick, you know, I'd, I'd thought this, you know, that's a <laughs> Nurofen Plus misuser. So, 
That, that was the that was the the typical picture, and and they did, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about this. They did really well on um, on uh, uh, buprenorphine and naloxone. They did really well on suboxone. Um, so, but before I talk a bit more about codeine, I, I just I don't think it's possible to discuss this without kind of looking at the whole issue of pharmaceutical opioids, and I won't go into great detail, um, but I'll frame it um, first of all. Uh, in the context of addiction medicine, it being an incredibly fascinating field and constantly changing, um, uh, and 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 um, uh, you know, constantly moving and dynamic, and and what's happened in the in the last uh, fifteen or so years, and what's happened is people have gone from supporting one team to being multi drug users. So you're not just a heroin addict, and you don't use uh, psychostimulants. Um, or alcohol or smoke pot, you, you use everything. Um, uh, so polysubstance abuse has become the norm, as, as people will know, work in drug and alcohol, walk, come, uh, come across drug and alcohol patients Reese, in the their last five or so years. Um, there's been a growth in psychostimulant use, crystalline methamphetamine that you will have seen on the news. Um, there's, there's a big change in cannabis, that's a whole presentation in itself, and I won't talk about that. But, um, you just have to, I mean, people used to roll joints in the old days, you know, uh, uh, and smoke joints. Now there's, if you, if you go on the internet, you'll see the technology for using cannabis is absolutely um, extraordinary. Uh, it's become a whole science and that's driven by, um, uh, uh, probably driven by the United States and the, uh, the states that have gone legal on medicinal cannabis and have gone legal on, on cannabis. Um, there's new devices because of consumption. This is all a fascinating field. If I was talking to potential registrars, I'd be selling this much more. Um, but uh, there's new devices for consuming drugs like e-cigarettes and various vaporizers for using cannabis. Um, there's growth in these drugs that you order over the internet or buy in sex shops, um, which are called uh, various things such as novel psychoactive uh, substances, which uh, um, in this country, uh, synthetic cannabis, so-called so synthetic cannabis, which is really just um, some foliage with um, uh, some sort of weird off offshore uh, formulated drug of, of unknown, uh, you know, constituents and uh, potency sprayed onto it. Um, uh, but that's that those um, formulations become very popular and they try to skirt around the law. And of course, there's pharmaceutical drugs of which opioids. I'll, I'll just talk a bit about. And. It, and what, on the back of this, um, for, for people like me working in drug and alcohol, what, what's happened in the start of this century is we've gone, as uh, people old enough to remember, might remember from um, a, a period in the 90s of abundant, especially in the east coast of Australia, the abundant cheap street markets of potent heroin that was killing about a Victorian a day. Um, to at the start of this century, as you can see, a, a massive drop in, in overdose deaths. And there's some debate whether that's going to come up. And it's certainly the discussion about what's going to happen with heroin uh, often comes up when we talk about uh, pharmaceutical opioids, because people might know the experience in North America is as soon as real-time prescription monitoring and regulation and tamper-resistant formulations, whatever, um, you know, locking doctors up in jail for prescribing for murder and whatnot, when those things started happening, uh, and since those things started happening, the use of pharmaceutical opioids has decreased, but the use of heroin, uh, Mexican heroin uh, particularly, has skyrocketed in the United States, and there's a um, great deal of concern. What's the total rate? Has it matched it? So the total no, I, I, I'm, so I'm not... Reduction, is in, in, the number of total, in the number of total deaths? So I'm not sure. I, th I think a lot of people, when you add up heroin deaths and pharmaceutical opioid deaths, it's... I think you know the Americans are very concerned about that, but uh, but you're talking about with regulation, the total number of deaths might have dropped. Yeah, sure. Um, so you know, I certainly think we're seeing a change, but it's a bit of a balloon squeezing, I think, and, and there has been a boom in heroin in a certain group who, um, uh, you know, and America's got slightly different drivers. So I don't know if we'll see it here, uh, such as private insurance and, and and so forth. So people can't afford. Uh, pharmaceutical opioids is the usual thing that people say, so they, they go to good old cheap heroin. I think it's almost the opposite here. Um, so uh, anyway, so we've, we've seen a, a drop in uh, heroin deaths in the, in, around this, uh, in the, throughout the century, and we've seen, um, uh, I know those, those charts look confusing, but we've seen basically a, a, a different, um, and I've seen this working in hospitals, a different proportion of uh, in the nature of presentations for opioids. So at the start of the century, you'd see, you, you take a couple of opioid users come into a hospital, into a hospital emergency department, most of them will be heroin overdoses, heroin-related morbidity more. 
um, and, and poisoning, but now um, the majority of pharmaceutical opioids, that, that's really all the take home message from those charts is. So, so that's a change. Um, and this is like one slide to summarise really um, the, the, you know, the much more elegant and detailed way that Malcolm uh, discussed pharmaceutical opioids. Um, and I'm not one of those people that think there's absolutely no place for pharmaceutical opioids in the management of pain. Um, however, um, uh, I, for me, drug and alcohol work has changed a lot since um, uh, you know, I work in a pain clinic in Caulfield and it's changed a lot since the management of pharmaceutical opioid dependence became a large part of our work uh, and, it's, and it is really challenging and it's, um, you know, burnt at least one of my colleagues out because uh, this, this is a challenging group to work with in the drug and alcohol sphere is the people who present with pharmaceutical opioid addiction. But um, so, so I'm biased and, and uh, I see obviously the, the, the pointy end and the difficult end and the, and the times, you know, I don't see people coming in and say, you know, I have no problem with my doctor's happy, I'm happy, everyone's happy with my use of pharmaceutical opioids at a low dose, They're managing my pain, I'm going to stop next week, everything's good, I only see the very, uh, you know, the, the, the really horrible cases. So, um, uh, you know, there's, but, but what, what uh, I think it's fair to say is there's, there's not a, a great deal, and you point out, Malcolm, a, a great deal of evidence for the benefit of long-term pharmaceutical opioids at high doses in the management of chronic pain. There's not a lot of long-term studies, I should say. I mean, and who wants to do long-term studies? I mean, you want to get your PhD over and 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 knock it off in a in a short time. And it, it is a it is a problem throughout uh, medicine, I think, and particularly in drug and alcohol. Um, and and the the quote, I'll, I really like this quote. I saw this quote of the ex-director of the CDC, and I think it really sums up. Um, but but uh, again, I'm looking at it from a maybe a jaundiced uh, perspective. Um, so from that, I just wanted to talk about the fascinating area of misuse of over-the-counter medications and then go on to a bit about codeine and, and codeine treatment. And um, when I started looking at, um, back in 2007, these people started wandering in and, um, and good old Malcolm Dobbin uh, tapped me on the shoulder and he said, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of these, this is, this is a really big issue. And I said, are you sure, Malcolm? And my colleague said to me, well, over the counter. I mean, it's not a big issue. What do you, what do you, why are you interested in this? And uh, you know, as, as I said, it became the, the most popular discussed uh, issue in my career, really. Um, so before I, before I did a study, and I'll go uh, through it briefly in a moment, I, I started to look at the, the, the history of over the counter opioid use, and people may know um, uh, this um, the misuse of dextromethorphan. There's a bit of uh, literature about th that anti tussive and, and the ability for it to put you in some sort of stupor if you drink a uh, super therapeutic amount of it. Um, there's um, there's uh, a lot out there about um, tampering. Like uh, I don't know if people heard of cold water extraction, particularly with codeine combination formulations. So there's quite a uh, science and uh, fascination in the in the community around um, what you can do with over the counter medications. There's even now reports drifting in the toxicologists tell me about misuse of modium. So. Um, uh, taking about 50 times the regular dose of lepiramide is, is um, supposed to have um, some euphoria associated with it. And, and the, the, other, the other things are, other than conversion of pseudoephedrine into methamphetamine is the conversion of, of codeine products into, um, into, into morphine, a crude form of morphine, which is not so popular in Australia. It has been done, um, but, but it's certain, the New Zealanders love to do this. Um, they're, they're very clever at doing this stuff because they don't have heroin in New Zealand. Um, so, so that's a, my summary of the the, the world of over-the-counter um, ingenuity. Um, and this is a this is a picture of, um, uh, and I've shown this picture in various forums before. There's a fellow that came into the ED at at, um, at Box Hill actually, and um, he'd been ordering um, diphenhydramine gel caps. So, oh, so this is a guy that was injecting. So if you can't if Malcolm Dobbin um, lobbies with the TJ to get um, temazepam gel caps taken off the market, what else have you got but um, diphenhydramine uh, unisom gel caps? So um, people are you know, very ingenious in the way they misuse uh, over-the-counter drugs. The other thing I want to say is we've got a, a very strong history in Australia of um, uh, over-the-counter, a bit like the English, and I think, um, and the New Zealanders, it's a, it's a colonial thing, I guess, that. Um, uh, we've we've had some ground, as people may know, we've had some groundbreaking work done in um, uh, by uh, Priscilla Kincaid-Smith in um, 
uh, analgesic nephropathy from Beck's powders back in the 60s, um, uh, from phenacetin. So it's, it's a, it's a trad cultural tradition in, in Australia, is, is what I wanted to say. Um, and this is just some national household drug survey statistics, again, supporting the idea that Australians uh, are very keen on um, uh, non-medical use of, uh, of opioids and, and over-the-counter opioids, uh, in particular with um, codeine being very highly represented in, um, in the National Household Drug Survey as a, as a drug that people report uh, using in a, a non-medical way. And again, I'm, I'm in order to, to get through my presentation, you might see things on the slide that I don't go into and I'm happy to answer questions about it, but uh, um, I will keep moving. So, what about codeine? Um, and again, um, uh, I think Malcolm mentioned that um, codeine is, is uh, methylmorphine and um, it's, uh, it's a mild opioid. I would consider it a crap, a crap opioid or a mediocre opioid. Um, and, and I think Penny was talking about um, uh, the number needed to treat, and that's, again, Mal Malcolm gave me these, Malcolm Dobbin gave me these, uh, this information. And um, uh, a lot of what Malcolm would have, would have submitted, um, uh, along with um, uh, myself and, and other people who are interested in this issue, when the TJ came to review um, scheduling of codeine, was the, the idea that um, codeine wasn't much better than uh, uh, in doses that are available over the counter than than simple analgesics, than, than paracetamol or paracetamol and ibuprofen or ibuprofen. Um, and, and it's already been mentioned that there's uh, the, other, the other issue with the mediocre opioid that is, is codeine, I think, is that it's um, not only is it not very potent, um, it's, there's variations in the way people metabolise it, as Penny was saying. There's um, uh, uh, Concern with children and Eastern health, and um, with um, with our uh, pain AAC, we've been through a pain advisory committee that I'm that I sit on. Uh, we've been through a process of um, taking codeine off the formulae for kids. Um, uh, Gala has been involved in that, and um, that's based on the information I think that was uh, uh, presented earlier on, and the the fact that uh, the children's of, don't use it for children and um, you know, and again, going to codeine being an issue that evokes a lot of passion, um, as I think we've heard throughout the evening, uh, uh, it, it, that was a really um, controversial. You would think, well, let's pull codeine off the formula for kids. The children's done it. Um, there's all this evidence. Um, the, the resistance that we got, particularly from emergency departments, was extraordinary. Um, uh, so, so it is an issue that evokes some some passion and uh, and uh, anger. So, uh, a lot of the a lot of the information, a lot of the research evidence about codeine goes to um, uh, case studies, and there's uh, there might be more than this now. And um, uh, where where I got involved was, as I said, with a, a study with Susie Nielsen and Malcolm Dobbin and Claire Tobe and myself. Uh, collected some cases and we got 27 cases together, the largest case study I think since and certainly to date then in um, uh, looking at over-the-counter codeine. And um, it was all the, the one product. And, um, uh, and there were some characteristics, a bit, a bit like the pathonomic sort of case that I, I um, presented earlier, Mr. CT, this group, they tended to be people that started codeine for management pain, they did um, they, uh, more, more women, it was a, a different opioid presentation group than the traditional illicit opioid users because that's about three to two um, males to females. This was almost equal uh, gender distribution. They are a bit older. Um, they, um, they had um, a little treatment contact before um, uh, and they had sort of three broad groups. A third had some sort of significant renal disturbance. A third had uh, bleeding in the gut, and a third, the primary presentation was I'm addicted to codeine. Um, and as I mentioned, they had a, a good response to um, buprenorphine naloxone. And I used to say back then, it's it's not actually a, so much about the codeine; it's about the two drugs mixed together. When we talk about ibuprofen codeine, it's about the combination. I don't know if people 
even know who Hall and Oates are, but <laughs> all I can say is they were a music group back in the 70s and uh, they're generally considered better together than on their own, or more potent together and, and more uh, influential. Okay, and the coroner, um, and, and one of the drugs on the real-time prescription monitoring list, I think, is the codeine combination products. And uh, this is in part because the literature review found that uh, codeine is really well represented in multi-drug toxicity deaths, and the coroner's commented on it. Okay, how am I going for time? I, I, I think I'm doing all right. Um, so I just wanted to finish up to, and talking a bit about um, the, the treatment of codeine dependence. And um, uh, I, I've sort of talked about this, and. Uh, um, and, I, and I've um, ref alluded to this idea that codeine users, and I think it's important coming into upscheduling that we that we um, you know might see um, the people involved in um, therapeutic clinical contact with this group might see a slightly different group than maybe we traditionally um, sort of expect from an opioid addicted person, opioid dependent person. They 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 as I mentioned, they tend to be a bit old. They tend to be more uh, often women. Um, and the, the, the really interesting thing was this group uh, um, often struggled to get into drug treatment because they'd had little contact with um, drug and alcohol treatment services. They tended to be people who um, had never injected drugs, never used illicit opioids. Some of them never smoked a joint. You know, they were very um, uh, 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 illicit drug use naive and, and treatment naive. Um, they often, as I mentioned, self um, started treatment for, a, for back pain or headaches or dysmenorrhea or whatever and um, you know, had a very good response to, to buprenorphine. And um, uh, I, I think um, the reason I always thought people did well on Suboxone for uh, codeine dependence, and, and I imagine as people start to continue to present to treatment after upscheduling, they will continue to respond to buprenorphine uh, therapy, with therapy with buprenorphine, naloxone or Suboxone is, uh, I think because um, the usual um, concerns about this therapy uh, aren't so much of an issue. It's, it is cost competitive with buying a, a packet of cone over the counter um, combination analgesics every day or two, and it's um, uh, the, the inconvenience of going to a pharmacy every day isn't as, as a big issue because uh, for Suboxone, because uh, people that use over the counter codeine are often doing that to different pharmacies. Um, and you know it's it's a well tolerated, particularly in, uh, compared to super therapeutic doses of ibuprofen containing analgesics, very well tolerated. And I put that last point: the risk of tapering. Uh, and again, with upscheduling, it might not be an issue. I, I, I often uh, people would often say to me, "Well, why don't you just um, isn't one way of management of this get people to taper down?" And and, and coming up to upscheduling, maybe that will be um, raised if they're working in drug and alcohol. What about tapering, just reducing the dose? And um, I usually caution people about that because I know of at least um, one one death happening from that because, of course, if you're going from, say, 40 uh, ibuprofen to, to 30, you're still at this toxic dose. And, and the death that I'm aware of was somebody who, who started to get abdominal pain while they're tapering there, uh, and they're still taking uh, massive doses and they'd had a perforation and, and died. And everyone just thought, oh, they're just getting a with withdrawal from uh, a reduction in codeine. So I, I think the better approach is to substitute um, buprenorphine, naloxone or, or methadone. Um, and so, yes, we're up scheduling again, and um, this is probably going to be the last time unless uh, <laughs> uh, code and combination products are made Schedule 8. Um, and, and, you know, one of the reasons, I think, is uh, after the 2010 uh, move from S2 to S3, um, the move from, you know, in the bargain bins and uh, sold by anyone in the pharmacy to um, behind the counter was not, in my experience, uh, didn't make much change to presentations. So there was a sort of still uh, a pretty much the same number of people. The only thing that changed was the uh, pack size and the, and the uh, multiples of the pack size that people presented um, using. And that uh, brings me to the last couple of slides and, and um, uh, the use of maintenance therapy or substitution therapy, um, as, as I keep saying, I've said about half a dozen times, really good response to um, buprenorphine and naloxone in this group. Um, it, it seems just a really, a, 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 a very good therapy for people who are um, over-the-counter codeine or codeine-dependent. Um, uh, 
the issues, uh, I've, I've spoken a bit about cost, there's still an issue of stigma and I think that's probably what makes Suboxone a bit more appealing to this group who are treatment naive, um, uh, illicit drug use naive perhaps and, and coming to a drug and alcohol service uh, sometimes feel a bit uncomfortable in um, b uh, being commenced on methadone even if there's a clinical indication because of the stigma attached with methadone, which doesn't appear to be the same with, with Suboxone. Um, uh, I've talked about the restrictiveness of programs, again, um, with people going to a chemist every day. Anyway, it's, it's probably not uh, a, as much of a concern. Um, the big issue with, um, since I started working in this area, the big issue with pharmacotherapy prescribing and treatment is the number of prescribers in the community. In, in rural and regional areas, it's also probably the dispense, number of dispensing points, but um, uh, the real pressure point is on um, the number of prescribers. We, the point of those pictures is we've got a distorted system where there's a few big um, high volume prescribers of uh, these medications, these opioid substitution medications, Suboxone, or buprenorphine and um, methadone, who carry most of the state's um, cohort of people on this treatment. Um, uh, the good news about that is people who are, who are general practitioners, um, may know that, um, or may be involved in the fact that uh, the policy in Victoria now allows you to have up to five uh, patients without doing all the fancy training in um, uh, opioid pharmacotherapy prescribing five patients on Suboxone. So the rules in Victoria, the guidelines or policy in Victoria says you don't have to do a whole lot of training to prescribe up to five people in your practice Suboxone. Anybody can do it, any GP can do it. Um, so we've got to, but we still have a distorted system. And um, as it happens, uh, even though that policy has been around for some years and I was involved in the development of that policy, it hasn't been taken up. And so there's still that small cohort of doctors who are getting older. And I don't think they're, they're getting old, they're, they're uh, looking towards retirement and I don't think we've got a succession plan for, for uh, those. So it's, all it's gonna take is a few of those doctors to drop out and I think we're gonna face some real challenges in Victoria. I'll finish up there, I think. I, I just, uh, it's a Victorian audience, um, and so um, I just, people are familiar with Drug and Alcohol Clinical Advisory Service. Um, uh, we get a lot of calls for, that's part of Turning Point, so it's part of my responsibility. So that's a 24 hour phone advisory service on drug and alcohol, completely free. You can ring at any time. Uh, uh, any, any clinician in Victoria can ring at any time to get advice on what to do about a, uh, any sort of drug and alcohol related issue. And that's maybe what you were referring to, Malcolm, when you said there's a, there's a drug and alcohol phone service but no pain service, uh, phone pain service. And I t we get a lot of pain calls. We, get, we do, we audit the, the calls every month and we, get, and we often say, you know, where's the, where's the addiction issue? Well, there's no real addiction issue but they're on a very high dose of fentanyl and, um, or something like that. So. Um, Anyway, that's Dacus, and, and um, if you don't know about it, didn't know about it, you do know about Dacus now. So, I'll, look, I'll finish there. Um, uh, Malcolm's already touched on uh, tamper-resistant or abuse deterrent forms of, of opioids, and, and I, I don't think they've been a big game changer either. Um, I think what will be a game changer is what's going to happen in the next uh, year or two, I think it's already happened in the United States, this is a depot form of buprenorphine. So that's really gonna change a whole lot of things around um, buprenorphine therapy. Um, but the, the positive side is, it, is it, it's gonna give us a lot more options anyway. Um, I've mentioned um, the, uh, the, the regulations and the, the, the fashion in the United States to, to go hard on opioid prescribers in the medical profession. Um, and, uh, and I think the other big game changer um, uh, is going to be uh, real-time prescription monitoring that, that Malcolm's mentioned. So I might finish up there and, um, you know, I think we've got time for a question or two perhaps yeah, or not. we'll or have not. a panel at the end. All right. But, uh, but why don't we stay here? Okay. Please, Matthew. If, uh, any questions for Matthew are in your mind? First of all, just a I only found out about the Suboxone um, when I was talking to the Olympic Day Cops. And I was talking to my colleagues and none of them have heard about being able to prescribe up to five patients since I just found out recently. So it's been around for a long time, nobody's ever heard of that. 
number one. And number two, because we don't know where we do it, where we actually start doing it. But my, my big question is, as a GP, we have this fear that we're going to be inundated by people walking in that we don't know. How many say, I'm taking 50 codeine over the counter and tablets every day, what are you going to do now? Um, this is our biggest fear. So I still don't have a sense of how many patients, I mean, it's all very well to model people coming back at chronic pain. I don't believe that because I think there'll be people who we don't know about, that, that none of us know about. How many of these people? Who doctors you know, go out to pharmacies, we don't really know. And so we're really worried about what are we going to do? Well, these people, we don't, I'm on 50 codeine tablets. What am I going to do each day? So what are we going to do with them? Uh, well, certainly what's turning point, urgently, but the point is you'll be in the And so yes, yes. this is the problem. We're, we're really concerned that the people we usually would get advice from when we refer people to, you're going to be so overwhelmed with these people. Now, I might be a catastrophizer in this situation, but a lot of GPs will all say, well, God knows, you know? I, I, I personally, um, uh, I don't, uh, if I was to bet on it, uh, you know, gamble on this issue. Turning Point's also a gambling centre, so I don't gamble. But um, I, do, I don't think you. I don't think I don't. I mean, I think it'd be great if people were inundated because it, you know, cause a revolution. And I don't think you'll be. I, I honestly don't think. I don't think. I don't think you'll be inundated. Uh, it'll be a trickle. It'll be like turning a big ship. Uh, that's my view. Look, I might be wrong. Um, Part of the new guidelines that was involved, the policy for, for opioid pharmacotherapy was um, uh, to change the culture of prescribing takeaway doses. That was all, that was part of the uh, role of the revision of those of that Victorian policy on pharmacotherapy, um, and and it, I think that's similar. That was a that's going to be a slow culture change, a, a slow. I, I, look, I might be wrong on this. I, I, I don't think suddenly someone's going to wake up on the 2nd of February saying, I've got no codeine left and, and rush to their doctor. But in, in answer to your question, I think um, prescribing Suboxone is very straightforward. Uh, it, it really is if you've prescribed a, a, a full op opioid agonist, I really think prescribing it, the doctor's role is very straightforward. I think it's a very easy, forgiving drug to prescribe. And um, I think the behaviours surrounding dependence are, are very challenging. But the pharmacology of that drug is is very straightforward, and if you, if you can prescribe a Schedule Eight opioid, it's it's very much easier to prescribe that particular Schedule Eight partial agonist drug. But I don't think you've been undated. That's that's my view. People might differ. I can see people shaking their heads, but um, just from my experience, it, human behaviour is such that people will stockpile, people will detox before the date and, and so there will, there will be a, a, a change in the culture of the nature of codeine use and the way people present to GPs around that issue but it won't happen in, in February. You know, it'll, it'll happen over years. Yeah. But, uh, sure, I think that's different. Yeah. yeah. Can I do a plug here at this point for the pharmacotherapy area based network? So Victoria is divided up into Five networks that covers the whole state of Victoria, and our role is to support GPs in um, prescribing Suboxone and, and supporting them with managing dependence. So, depending where you are, there's a pharmacotherapy area based network that covers you, so it would be good to perhaps link in with them. And um, some of them are here you need tonight. To um, and you will find the records. It is a permanent system. If you start with someone on the Suboxone, because it's quite a dependence, so you have to apply to a permanent way to be okay. And there's a, there's a four-page um, cheat sheet. I'm telling doctors how to do it. And Maureen, Agri Maureen would agree that there's... It's not surprising that not everybody knows about the five. Mm. It's, a, it's a small government department, and it's probably down to Maureen to tell every GP in the state. Yeah. Um, it's all, the RSG GP has module right online around safe open or um, So we encourage everyone to do that and use the government website and the RSG website. And also the, the, sorry, the, 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 the patterns have their own website too where you can just put in the postcode where you live and it'll tell you who your support person is. So I'll send the TGA guys a link for that so mm -hmm. they can distribute that. 
So we can add a whole host of other links, and we already have on the coding information hub to other external uh, parties to, to the TGA. So we can grab this information. That's right. Now, there's a question here, Matthew. Um, I hate to admit this, but I recall those uh, APC issues very, very well. So that tells you a few things. Um, I've been in the drug regulatory business for pretty well all of my adult life, and I think I can say pretty confidently that codeine was never much of a problem until it was combined with ibuprofen, not with codeine, uh, with, with paracetamol, paracetamol but it was, and we see this today, that despite the fact that there's a larger amount of codeine phosphate in panadine extra, it is the ibuprofen combination that attracts more problems. What is it about that combination that has caused this huge upsurge. I think the genie was let out of the bottle when it was in Schedule 2, and as you said quite rightly, when it went into Schedule 3, it made a little bit of a difference initially, but picked up again. So I don't know what it is that why that particular combination has been attract so attractive to so many. Is it because of it's just a better amplitude? It, it, yeah, it's, it could be the Hall and Oates phenomenon, and the, the combination is particularly appealing. Um, I've had people that say mm. I've had oxycodone in, as oxycontin and I prefer Nurofen Plus to somebody who's Nurofen Plus dependent, which was extraordinary. Mm. She, she said, I don't want oxycontin anymore. I'd, I'd rather be taking mega doses of Nurofen Plus. So I don't know. If, I think ibuprofen is more forgiving in, in chronic high doses. It's, mm. it's, it seems to be more tolerable. And even though it's dreadfully damaging, um, people seem to have discomfort about taking high doses of paracetamol every day. But yeah, I don't I don't quite know what the reason is. But you're right, it wasn't until uh, that, mm. that combination came along. And it, but it was marketed well and it, and it was pushed by um, a company that, that you know, was mm. renowned yeah. for pushing to, to TJ. Did it go straight to the side of pushing it, did they? <laughs> <laughs> from a, from a, a comment about uh, What's happening out there? The, the branding of ibuprofen as an open seller has been around for a long mm, time. Safe. And I think the consumers have that concept that uh, Europe uh, is marketed heavily uh, on, tele on national television, and people don't see the difference between that and the S3 uh, mm, schedule. Mm, yeah, is better. And that has a big uh, impact on consumers. Mm. Yeah. From an acute pain perspective, there is an advantage of high-dose non-steroidals. It, it penetrates the brain, yeah. it's a neuroinflammatory component, and it's quite effective as an mm. analgesic in high doses. It prevents dementia. It takes out your gut, but you've got a good brain to go with it. <laughs> There's no gut. <laughs>